Hello, my name is Chris Blundell. I'm a consultant foot and ankle surgeon based at Sheffield and I work for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Uh, we're going to talk about Lisfranc uh, injuries. And during this talk, uh, the objectives are to talk about the anatomy involved in Lisfranc injuries, the mechanisms uh, by which Lisfranc injuries occur, some of the patterns of injury which are predictable, some of the treatment options that we have for treating Lisfranc injuries, as well as their complications, and we'll touch upon some of the controversies in managing this group of patients. He didn't actually describe the injuries, but did describe a uh, quick and effective bloodless amputation through the uh, midfoot, uh, which is described as Lisfranc's joint, and for that reason, Lisfranc injuries have been named after him. Here is a typical situation in which a Lisfranc injury can occur. These images are of a 25-year-old motorcyclist uh, who has an isolated injury to the limb, but clearly there are many injuries occurring here, and it's easy therefore to focus on perhaps the more dramatic of the injuries, which is clearly the posterior fracture dislocation at the ankle, and thereby missing or ignoring the severe injury that has occurred through the Lisfranc's joint. And because of distracting injuries that occur, Lisfranc injuries are not infrequently missed. Lisfranc injuries are also uh, missed because they're not really very common. They only represent uh, only 0.2% of all orthopedic injuries at all, and they're difficult to treat. The problem with missing them is that uh, the late presentation of a Lisfranc makes treatment much more challenging. They're not only the dramatic fracture that you saw on the previous slide, Lisfranc injuries can be relatively subtle sprains and can occur in athletes as well. Because they get missed, they are a source of litigation and the outcomes are not good. And for that reason, it's very important to consider Lisfranc injuries in patients with a threatening swollen foot. The anatomy in this region is complex and it's important to uh, consider for a moment the ligamentous structures that are on the plantar aspect of the foot as well as on the dorsal aspect. On the left of this slide, the dorsal structure of the anterior tibial tendon or tibialis anterior that crosses onto the navicular supports the medial column of the foot. But Lisfranc's ligament, which you can see there, crosses between the base of the second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform and is made up of three parts, the dorsal part, an interosseous part and the plantar part, with the plantar part being the strongest. And you can see inside that red circle on the image on the right, the plantar tarsometatarsal metatarsal ligament which is Lisfranc's ligament. On these cross-sectional images, the ligament's clearly seen running between the medial cuneiform on the lateral side and the medial side of the second metatarsal base, bonding the second metatarsal into a recess between the first and, second, first and third metatarsals, uh, providing a very strong and stable area within the midfoot. This bonding of the second metatarsal creates a keystone in the transverse arch of the foot. Rather like that beautiful arch that you can see on the top left of this image, the central stone is acting to push the other stones apart, which are then in turn tied to the ground. This stone has therefore got great compressive strength. And the second metatarsal acts very much like a keystone between the medial column and the third ray. And it's Lisfranc's ligament which holds the second metatarsal firmly into this arch thereby providing the keystone. Often the midfoot is considered in columns and either three columns or two columns. And on this slide, we can see a three column image where the first column on the medial side is made up of the navicular, the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal. The middle column is made up of the second and third metatarsals and their respective cuneiforms. And the lateral column is made up of the fourth and fifth metatarsals with the cuboid. Lisfranc's ligament bonds the middle column to the medial column, holding that second metatarsal firmly against the medial cuneiform bone. So we've shown there that the anatomy here is complex and that Lisfranc's ligament is a ligament strongly bonding the middle part of the foot to the medial part of the foot. It's important to consider that the dorsal ligaments are a lot weaker than the plantar ligaments. The classic mechanism of injury uh, in a Lisfranc is essentially one in which the forefoot is fixed whilst the body rotates over a fixed forefoot. And this can occur in stud sports um, as well as in more high energy situations. 
Somewhere between a third and two thirds of all Lisfranc injuries occur in road accidents in the Western world. And eight out of 10 of these patients are in fact multiply injured. And as I mentioned earlier, that leads to distracting injuries whereby the Lisfranc's injury is missed. Sometimes these injuries occur in a much more low energy and much more subtle situation. And a classic situation here would be a curb injury in which someone slips off a curb, planting the forefoot in rotation on the hind foot. Rather than those indirect mechanisms of injury, a Lisfranc injury can occur from a direct injury as well. And this will be a crush injury, often associated with multiple fractures. And the position in which the deforming force is applied leads to the residual abnormality. Thereby, if the force is applied distal to Lisfranc's joint, then the metatarsals tend to be subluxated plantarward. Whilst in image C here, we can see the force has been applied more proximally at the level of the cuneiforms, thereby pushing the uh, midfoot beneath the metatarsals, which are then subluxated or dislocated dorsally. And roughly speaking, in terms of direct injuries, half of these patients will have metatarsals that are displaced plantarward and half where it's displaced dorsally. As I mentioned before, it can be a twisting force which occurs with a foot which is fixed to the floor and whilst the body is rotated off a fixed forefoot. And this will classically happen in people whose forefoot is fixed to the ground, such as in stud sports or um, in equine situations where the forefoot is in a stirrup and the person's thrown from the horse whilst the foot remains fixed in the stirrup. So just to summarize the key learning points here, Lisfranc injuries can occur either from an indirect injury in which the forefoot is fixed and the body is rotated from it, or a direct injury when the direction of the, the resulting deformity is determined by the application of the force, both in terms of its direction and where that force is applied onto the foot. One needs to keep remembering always that although we've focused on the ligament itself and the bone, the soft tissues are significantly injured in Lisfranc injuries, and one must always think about soft tissue care. So in order not to miss these, one needs to keep a high index of suspicion in a patient who's got an appropriate mechanism of injury, particularly if they've got pain which is greater than you would expect in the presence of a swollen foot with a good mechanism of injury. If there's a shape change of the foot, then this is a Lisfranc injury until proven otherwise. Particularly if there's a plantar ecchymosis, if there's bruising on the plantar aspects of the foot, that's very indicative of a Lisfranc injury. Plain x-rays are the mainstay of investigation here, and on an AP image, it's very important to look at the alignment of the first and the second tarsal metatarsal joints. In other words, look at the alignment of the first metatarsal to the medial cuneiform, the second metatarsal to the intermediate cuneiform, and then the second metatarsal in relationship to the medial cuneiform, where Lisfranc's ligament is. An oblique view is very helpful as well, particularly looking at the lateral aspects of the foot and the uh, third, fourth, and fifth tarsal metatarsal joints. Particularly in those situations where there's been a direct deforming force, the lateral image will show subluxation of the metatarsals relative to the cuneiform bones. And that image at the bottom of this slide demonstrates plantar displacement of the metatarsals on the cuneiform bones. Although x-rays are absolutely mandatory here, 40% of injuries are in fact missed on the initial radiographs. And so a high index of clinical suspicion is what's required in order to make sure that we miss the minimum number of Lisfranc's that we can. Turning then to close examination of the uh, x-rays, the AP, the oblique and the lateral, these are the areas where focus should be uh, most uh, clearly given. The second metatarsal needs to align, uh, as the blue arrows in the top left uh, view show, the second metatarsal needs to align very clearly with the intermediate cuneiform and there's a straight line that runs between the intermediate cuneiform space down the second metatarsal. On the oblique view particularly we're looking at the alignment between the lateral cuneiform and the third metatarsal and the fourth metatarsal and the cuboid. There should be a, only a small overlap between the fifth metatarsal base and the cuboid bone that can be seen in the bottom left hand image. In order not to miss subtle injuries one must 
pay particular attention to the interval between the base of the second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform, where there is the so-called fleck sign. This fleck is actually a small piece of bone which has been avulsed. Whilst Lisfranc ligament itself is intact, the avulsion of the bone that's been pulled off either from the medial cuneiform or, as in this image, from the base of the second metatarsal, gives rise to the fleck sign and the widening of the interval between the second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. And great care needs to be focused looking at this area and specifically looking for this subtle fleck sign, which was originally described by uh, Mark Myerson in 1986. However, although we're focusing here on the injury between the second metatarsal and the relevant cuneiform bones, lateral injuries often occur as well. And these cu cuboid fractures are described as a nutcracker fracture, and they occur as the forefoot is forcibly abducted against the lateral column creating a, a compression fracture of the distal part of the cuboid bone. Uh, and that by the lateral column then becomes shorter and they lose lateral stability and the forefoot's then able to drift into a planar abduction deformity down the track. Further imaging can be very helpful in subtle injuries. Standing x-rays are extremely useful to show that widening of the interval. And if you, there's cause for concern, much like there is in syndesmotic injuries, one can x-ray the opposite side for comparison to make sure that the widened interval isn't a normal variant in this patient and that there has been a, a genuine injury to Lisfranc's ligament. Sometimes uh, we need to screen uh, the foot uh, either under local anaesthetic or more often than not an examination under anaesthetic to demonstrate the degree of instability that occurs. With purely ligamentous injuries, uh, I find that ultrasound scan or MRI scan uh, is really the modality of choice. Stress testing under an anaesthetic, in other words, an examination under an anaesthetic, in which the forefoot is abducted against the rear foot, can demonstrate widening of the interval uh, at Lisfranc's ligament. Uh, and you can see here the flex sign has become apparent as the second metatarsal has moved away, and Lisfranc's ligament is only carrying a small piece of bone that's been evolved from the second metatarsal. So in abduction, the flex sign can become even more obvious. In this case, not only is there widening of the second metatarsal relative to the medial cuneiform, but one can see on stressing that in fact the first metatarsal is also unstable and has been carried laterally from the medial cuneiform bone, as indicated by the break between that yellow line on the medial border of the foot. If there is index of suspicion for a Lisfranc injury, CT scan is really very helpful. We'll often demonstrate fractures that are not apparent on the plane radiographs, so again, on this sagittal CT scan, one can clearly see an avulsion from the base of the second metatarsal here, uh, which was carrying Lisfranc's ligament, and there's instability and displacement of the second metatarsal there. One can also see the flex sign on that CT scan. On the bottom two images, these are T2 weighted sequence MRI scans, and you can see a high signal within the base of the second metatarsal. And this is very good uh, imaging modality for the more subtle uh, injury patterns. MRI scan is not routinely carried out. So as always, there are classification systems for uh, Lisfranc injuries, and these are the three most commonly referred to, the Kano and Kuss classification from the early part of the 1900s, uh, and then Hardcastle in 82, and that was again uh, added to by Myerson in 1986. Classifications are always very useful if they make you think really carefully about the x-rays that you're looking at. But these classifications are not really prognostic and don't really consider the ligamentous component to the injury, nor do they really consider the stability uh, that's present. And they're really purely descriptive. The images on the left here is Hardcastle's classification and on the right is Kino and Kuss's uh, classification, which is probably the most commonly referred to in terms of incongruent or divergent injury patterns. There's also a staging uh, of soft tissue injuries in which Lisfranc uh, ligament has been injured without a bony fracture as such. Stage one is uh, simply a sprain without the presence of any diastasis. However, when there is a diastasis but without uh, loss of the actual height of the arch, this is considered to be a stage two. In stage three, there's a widened diastasis but also a loss of the arch height longitudinally on a lateral view. Once we've made the diagnosis uh, on our imaging, there are some questions that we need to really consider. Is the injury itself 
stable or unstable, and is there an injury simply to the ligament or to the bone or to both? We need to think about these and we need to scan those patients, consider stress imaging, think about the soft tissues as well, and then consider, does this patient need surgery to provide reduction of the anatomy and stability, and also, of course, to look after those soft tissues, and if so, when? We know that patients do better if the anatomy is reduced and that, that, main that reduction is then maintained. And our objectives are to provide a stable foot, which is plantar grade, that is stable enough to require early ambulation and down the track so that the patient can wear normal footwear. If the anatomy isn't reduced, then there's an increased risk of osteoarthritis occurring within this foot, and we want to minimize that. There have been a number of studies demonstrating that the objective of anatomical reduction should be paramount. And Bruce and Jorzen's group published this uh, uh, in association with the outcomes. And Myerson uh, in 86 really did the, the biggest uh, piece of work, which was a regression analysis, showing that the better the reduction, the better the results. And he demonstrated 50 to 93% good or excellent results in terms of clinical outcomes if he had uh, achieved a good reduction. Whilst particularly at the other end of the spectrum, those in which he hadn't achieved a good reduction uh, had a very poor outcome. And it's really a one-to-one -one correlation between the quality of the anatomical reduction and the long-term outcome of the patient. This is a graphical representation of Myerson's work, demonstrating essentially the better the reduction, the better the outcome. And conversely, those that had a poor reduction had a poor clinical outcome. Some features to the original injury actually give you a good idea of a poor prognosis. Clearly, non-anatomical reduction will always lead to a poor prognosis, but those that have sustained the Lisfranc injury from a crush or with severe comminution, and at the other end of the spectrum, those in which there's purely a ligamentous injury without any bony fractures, all do poorly. So the question then comes, if we want to try and achieve reduction, when should we try and operate on these patients? Often patients have a significant soft tissue injury with swelling and blisters, and for this reason, sometimes a staged soft tissue protocol is better. We quite frequently put uh, small external fixators on the medial and or the lateral column of the foot to provide skeletal stability whilst we wait for the soft tissues to settle sufficiently to provide an opportunity for open reduction and internal fixation. Crush injuries particularly are associated with compartment syndrome within the foot. The management of that isn't really part of this talk and is controversial. If left alone, there is a risk that the compartment syndrome within the foot will lead to a shortening of the flexors within the plantar compartments of the foot and therefore lead to clawing. Perhaps the nerves in the sole of the foot, which are the medial and lateral branches of the tibial nerve, can also get involved in the compartment syndrome leading to painful paresthesia. But balanced against this is the risk of opening the compartments to release the pressure and creating an open fracture rather than the original closed fracture that you were dealing with in the first case. And for this reason, more often than not now, compartment syndrome in the foot is managed in an expectant way rather than an operative way. Patients who have only sustained a soft tissue injury, a ligament injury, uh, are often now treated with a fusion. And Chris Kurtzier from the US has published uh, very useful advice uh, in the American Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in terms of fusion in patients who have only sustained a soft tissue injury uh, to Liz Frank. Controversy remains about how to treat these, uh, particularly in certain circumstances, such as an undisplaced Lisfranc frank injury. In my mind, an undisplaced Lisfranc frank injury can be managed non-operatively if it is stable, and an examination under anaesthetic is a useful way of demonstrating whether there's stability or not. Clearly, if it's undisplaced but unstable, it does need stabilizing somehow. If it's undisplaced but stable, then one can manage that expectantly with a close eye kept on x-rays over the ensuing few weeks and keeping the patient non-weight bearing in a plaster. If there's displacement, we do know, of course, that uh, reduction of the anatomy leads to a better outcome. And so displaced uh, Lisfranc injuries need to be reduced and stabilized. Closed reduction is extremely difficult in Lisfranc injuries. And by and large, most people now will open the Lisfranc uh, injury to achieve anatomical reduction, which is so important. In terms of what hardware to use, uh, the options really are to use uh, wires or plates or screws or an external fixator. 
Few of us now use wires because they're not so stable and there's a risk of subsequent sepsis in these injured soft tissues. And so more people now uh, tend to bridge plate uh, Lis Frank's joints, thereby not creating a secondary injury to the chondral surfaces. Whilst reduction and holding the reduction with screws clearly invades the chondral surface of a joint which has already been injured once, and bridging plates tend to avoid this. External fixators on the lateral column are extremely useful, but equally well, if that can be held with K-wires, uh, that's an acceptable treatment for the lateral column. The use of tight ropes uh, hasn't uh, yet really taken off, but maybe something that we are thinking of in the future. Considering primary fusion in Lisfranc injuries, Muller published in Foot and Ankle International in 2002, primary fusion in those in which there was severe displacement with damage to the chondral surface as part of the Lisfranc injury. For those who have sustained ligamentous injuries alone, because of the increased risk of osteoarthritis, which is as much as 40% in this group, Co published in 2000 uh, fusions for those who've got primary ligamentous injury. And this is now probably the most widely considered group of patients who do have primary orthodesis for Lisfranc injuries. In 2006, Chris Kurtzia in the US uh, carried out a prospective randomized study of patients with severe Lisfranc injuries, comparing those who'd had anatomic open reduction and internal fixation with those who had anatomic internal fixation and reduction, but also underwent a primary arthrodesis. And his group demonstrated better functional results in those in which a fusion had been primarily carried out. This slide demonstrates some of the different uh, varieties of reduction fixation techniques, where the more traditional use of screws across Lisfranc's joint uh, at the first, second and third rays with K wires in the fourth and fifth rays is demonstrated in the image on the left, whilst the image at the bottom shows the use of a locking plate bridging the first, second and third uh, metatarsals onto the relevant cuneiform bones. And the image on the bottom right shows two plates used, one in the first ray and one across the second. On the top right, uh, this surgeon has used tightrope anchors uh, to hold the second metatarsal into the medial cuneiform. Postoperatively, patients are managed in a uh, short non-weight bone plaster, usually for about six weeks. A careful eye is kept to make sure that these patients don't uh, get chronic regional pain syndrome, which is uh, definitely a risk in uh, crush injuries particularly. After the cast is removed, patients are mobilized weight bearing with physiotherapy, usually using a walking boot uh, for a further six weeks. Questions regarding removal of the metalwork depends, of course, on whether uh, the patient has had a bridging plate or a primary arthrodesis. It also depends, of course, on uh, the patient's demands. A more sporty patient who wishes to return to sport may well have the metalwork removed around six months after the original injury. And often these patients will require some form of orthotic support for at least six months to maintain foot, foot shape. Of course, this treatment is fraught with difficulties, uh, particularly uh, in situations like this, where the patient's had the first metatarsal plated in a bridging manner across onto the medial cuneiform, but there's been some elevation of the first metatarsal uh, at the time of surgery, and great care needs to be uh, made that the reduction uh, is genuinely anatomical in all three or four. In this situation, the uh, first, second, and third rays have been well reduced and stabilized with screws, you can see in these red circles that there's uh, been some uh, injury to the cuboid bone in the manner of a nutcracker fracture, as we discussed earlier. And this has been managed with the use of a, a delta construct lateral uh, fixator, maintaining the length of the lateral column by bridging into the uh, fourth and fifth metatarsals down to the uh, calcaneus. And you can see on the uh, red circle on the left that that cuboid bone with ligamentotaxis has been restored and the lateral column has maintained its length. This is vital to prevent late recurrence of abduction and a planar deformity. In severe situations, such as a, a road traffic accident in which there's been a rollover injury, the soft tissues can be very severely uh, involved. And under these circumstances, often you'll need the assistance of plastic surgeons to uh, carry out split skin grafts or flaps onto the foot to uh, create uh, a soft tissue envelope which is suitable. And you wouldn't really want to be putting internal hardware here. And so, External fixators, again, are used to maintain a reduction in position uh, whilst the soft tissues settle with the help of your uh, plastic surgical colleagues. Of course, severe high energy injuries are associated with uh, other abnormalities. And you can see here a, a, a very nasty transverse distal tibial fracture uh, with a burst foot. And this patient's uh, 
really has a limb threatening injury which needs to be uh, considered uh, in conjunction with plastic surgeons and the use of external fixators and managing the associated injuries appropriately. And in this situation, uh, the use of a fine wire fixator to maintain both the foot and the tibial fracture was necessary. And you can see here that despite the uh, use of the spanning fixator and grafting on the sole of the foot, the um, lesser rays have sustained vascular injuries as well. And you can see necrotic uh, toes on the lateral aspect of this foot, as marked by the red arrows. This really is primarily a soft tissue injury with fractures underneath. And we often fall back on the same philosophy that we've used for pilon fractures of a span and then scan and then plan philosophy in order to manage these soft tissues and provide bony stability underneath. Clearly this requires the right operation done in the right place at the right time by the right person. Anatomical reduction is paramount restoring the column lengths, particularly thinking of the lateral column, where if this remains short, there'll be a late progress to an abduction deformity, and you're really pulling the foot off your medial columns if the lateral column is unstable or short, and your fixation may well fail medially as well. So maintain the length of the columns as well, and think that you need to provide stable fixation and appropriate relatively early rehabilitation uh, to the patient. Of course, this is complex surgery with complex injuries. Complications do uh, occur, uh, and there's a list here of those complications, which of course include uh, damage to the uh, perineal nerves, particularly the superficial perineal nerve over the dorsum of the foot, vascular injury to the dorsalis pedis artery, which remember uh, links the dorsal and plantar uh, arterial arcades by a perforating vessel that goes right anterior or distal to Lis Frank's uh, ligament and is at risk when you're intervening in the interspace between the first and second metatarsals. Malposition is bad news and we've uh, really hammered home the point of anatomical reduction. The hardware you use can be prominent and can fail. I often warn patients that there's a risk with bridging plates that those plates or screws may break. Uh, hopefully by the time they do, there's enough fibrous uh, stability uh, to not lead to late displacement. Arthrofibrosis is a problem and arthritis if the chondral surfaces have originally been damaged. And of course, there's the risk of some instability, particularly, as I've said before, if the lateral column isn't appropriately restored. Focusing particularly on infection, which uh, can occur in as much as 16% of cases, it needs aggressive treatment and early intervention. The use of vacuum assisted therapy is very helpful and you'll need plastic surgical colleagues uh, if the wound is starting to break down. Uh, think about uh, deep sepsis and adequate debridement treatment with antibiotics, either uh, parenterally or even locally delivered uh, antibiotics to the site of the infection. And obviously there is always, unfortunately, the risk of uh, limb loss in these injuries. Some of the uh, later sequelae uh, of these injuries is uh, recurrent deformity. You can see in the lateral x-ray uh, at the bottom here that there's been, uh, in essence, a flat foot that's formed with a uh, an abnormality at the level of Lisfranca more proximally uh, with dorsiflexion of the distal part. Um, this is really a, a non, uh, sorry, a malunion, but clearly these bones don't always unite, so non-union is a risk. And later on, as you can see the image at the top, there's some uh, osteoarthritis occurring at Lisfranc's joints, which were injured at the time of the original fracture dislocation. These patients do carry a higher risk than average of chronic regional pain syndrome. Thinking about the development of osteoarthritis, uh, in these patients, they have sustained a primary chondral injury, particularly in the more high energy uh, injuries in which there's been crushing or comminution at the level of the joints. Non-anatomical reduction will, of course, uh, give you a much higher risk of development of osteoarthritis, both in the joints involved and in adjacent joints if there's a deformity. And chondrolysis uh, can occur secondary to sepsis or even uh, local avascular necrosis at the level of the uh, fractures and uh, the get out clause, of course, here uh, is a fusion. So turning to Lisfranc's fusions, uh, we tend to do this with uh, plates and or screws. Uh, again, trying to restore the anatomy, uh, particularly in the uh, late presentation of a Lisfranc injury, it can be very challenging to restore the anatomy. Uh, we use uh, localizing injections to determine which joints are actually the most painful ones so that we try to do a fusion uh, limiting that to the uh, medial columns of the foot uh, and trying to preserve the motion uh, of the lateral column at all costs.
This patient had a Lisfranc uh, fracture, which was uh, not treated with anatomical reduction. And you can see the late sequelae in the uh, right foot of an abduction and planar deformity with a midfoot break. And that's been treated uh, very nicely uh, with restoration of that midfoot break and a fusion of the first, second and third uh, TMT joints with screws. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to restore the length of the columns. You can see in this particular uh, case, the fifth tarsal metatarsal joint remains uh, dislocated with the uh, fifth metatarsal overlapping the cuboid on that oblique view where you should really see a nice patent joint space and the lateral column hasn't been restored here. And one can also see that the medial uh, rays are still in abduction. So it's very important to get the column length right and to get the rotation correct uh, to try and avoid residual deformity. Of course, there are controversies around Lisfranc's management, whether one should use screws. And as I said earlier, uh, the risk of screws is that you're creating a second chondral injury uh, to a joint which has already uh, sustained a chondral injury at the time of the fracture dislocation. Whether you should bring the second metatarsal onto the medial cuneiform, as I do, or the other way, um, whether there should be a primary fusion or open reduction, and we've talked about that, uh, that the, those with very severe chondral injury or those in which there's only a ligamentous injury probably do better with a limited primary arthrodesis. What to do when they present late in terms of reconstruction we've touched upon. And some surgeons are using tightrope uh, suture anchors to try to uh, maintain some motion in the joints whilst also maintaining reduction. I have no personal experience of this and also how to manage compartment syndromes. And I think most surgeons now are tending to treat this expectantly really with support and analgesia rather than creating uh, an open fracture in one which was originally closed. So in summary, really, these are difficult fractures and complex anatomy. Uh, it's best to get this right at the first time as it always is, uh, hence the first bite at the cherry. If you don't, then there's a significant major disability down the track and re redo operations in which there's an attempt at a late reconstruction uh, is both technically challenging and the outcomes are not as good. This frank injuries need to be considered as a severe soft tissue injury um, with bony fractures and instability underneath. It's so important to restore the length of the columns, both the medial and the lateral columns. The results are variable, but we do know that the better the anatomical reduction, the better the long-term outcome. Ultimately, uh, fusion remains the mainstay of uh, reconstruction in the event that uh, the patient doesn't do well. Thank you very much for listening to this uh, slideshow uh, regarding Lisfranc injuries on behalf of the British Orthopaedic Foot and Ankle Society.